Hi, uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here with EdChat Interactive, and it's 6.30 in, uh, Eastern Time, so uh, we're about to get started. Uh, tonight, we have Yang Zhao, who's going to be talking to us about world-class learning, and um, I'd like to give just a brief intro into EdChat Interactive and, and a little bit about the Shindig platform before we get started, uh, because it is a little bit different from other plat other webinar platforms that, that you may have used. Uh, first of all, let me expand the slides a little bit. And uh, you should just understand, EdChat Interactive was put together by uh, Steve Anderson, Tom Whitby, and myself. Our goal was to change the whole webinar experience to make it much more interactive. And hopefully you'll experience that tonight. Uh, and we chose a Shindig platform because of the, the large number of things that you can do with Shindig. Um, for example, um, underneath your avatar in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that there are two buttons. Uh, one of the buttons is, is a picture of a hand. It says raise, and the other is ask. Um, if you have a question that you'd like to ask Yong Zhao, uh, you can click on ask. Actually, the question will be going to me. Um, so if it's a technical question and it's, and if it's not for young, you can still enter it in there. And um, if it's a question for young, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to him. Uh, raise hand is something that we'll be doing, a, we may be doing a few times during the presentation. Uh, if we want volunteers to come up on stage, like I'm on stage right now, um, we'll ask you to raise your hand. Um, I know one of the things that Corwin asked, because this is part of the Corwin series, is if you're in a room with a bunch of other people, um, they'd like to just get a feeling of how many people are, are here as individuals and how many people are here with a group. So if you're here with a group of people, can you click the raise hand button underneath your avatar so you can just get a feel of how many of you are in groups versus individuals? And let me, I'll shrink this just in case it's obliterating the area on your screen. And I see that there's uh, one or two people right now who are here in groups. Good. Okay. Uh, because, you know, you, you can watch this individually, but even if you're an individual, you're, you're part of a group anyhow, because as you see, you're, you're in a room. Now, an, another feature of Shindig is, um, <clears throat> are the, uh, the settings. If you move your cursor over your avatar in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see that there's a menu of five things. And one of those items is called IM. So I'm going to shrink this again. If you click on IM, that's a way for you to interact with some of the other participants here. And what I'd like to you encourage you now is to click on that to open it and then type in uh, your name and where you're from into the IM. And let's start sharing those with, with some of the other people. And while you're doing that, I want to uh, bring your attention to the, the main reason why we use Shindig, which is the ability for you to uh, have a private video conference with somebody else who is participating. And usually we have an exercise where we encourage you to click on the icon of another person and talk to that person right now. But I have a feeling that there's so much that Dr. Zhao has to say that I don't want to take up the two or three minutes that that would take, and I'd like to bring him up. So, so what I'd like to do is just to, um, well, first let you know that we, over the next uh, couple weeks, we still have a few more EdChat interactives. On March 17th, we're going to be talking about something called immersive democracy, which is a way of aligning the values of all participants in the school, the students, the teachers, and the administrators to come up with a vision and, and have, the school, have the school have one voice um, and maximize student learning. And then on March 22nd, we're going to have Zachary Walker, um, who's doing this whole series on, uh, on how to use technology in the classroom. And on March 22nd, he's going to be talking about the use of photos uh, to spur student interaction and, um, and for deeper learning. But now, uh, without further ado, uh, let me stop my slideshow and bring up uh, Dr. Zhao. Hi, I say good evening, but you're on the West Coast, so Hi, it's afternoon. So, well, so, so I was I was looking through some of your videos um, on on YouTube, 
And, you know, one of the things that kind of struck me is you said that we're right now in an age of abundance. And then kind of you said, and if, um, let, me, let, me, let me find the, um, the exact thing. If, if even Lady Gaga can be useful, anybody can be useful. So maybe I'd, I'd just give you a chance to elaborate on what, it, what do you mean by we're in an age of abundance? Uh, thanks, Mitch. I think uh, the the whole um, conversation this afternoon is really around that how Lady Gaga become useful, uh, mm -hmm. uh, s something like that. It's uh, uh, I think you know uh, when I think about um, age of abundance, I think about uh, we have because of technology uh, increased productivity, and then so we have uh, more leisure time and more disposable income. Because I came from. Uh, mm -hmm. The age of necessity. I was born, and raised in a Chinese village, and uh, my father and my father's father. I think uh, all these people he, there I saw, uh, they were really struggling for necessities, and the necessity means stuff to keep you alive, to keep you physiologically alive. So food, shelter, and clothing. And now I think U.S. come to the age of abundance. In the U.S., we we have a lot more disposable income and a lot more leisure time. So we began to take care of our. Um, psychological, intellectual, uh, uh, aesthetic needs, and uh, not physiological. So therefore, we consume very different things. We consume psychological services and products. And, uh, you know, for example, I was joking about this in America, uh, this profession called life coaches has um, become right. something really important. As my mm -hmm. father is now, he's 90, he never had a life coach, he was fine. You know, and there's things, uh, psychologists, mm -hmm. psychiatrists, and, uh, and then, of course, entertainment is a big deal now. Entertainment right. is like uh, uh, Lady Gaga uh, becomes useful because she provides some kind of psychological relief to somebody or psychological stress to somebody. And we may uh, even have an entertainer who runs for president, right? Uh, well, that, that's that's probably why Trump is is up there. It's it's, it's actually quite uh, quite fascinating to look at this. So we we can you know age of abundance. What you, one thing we do because it's, there's needs are psychological. They are very mm -hmm. personal. Once it's personal, then we want choices. That's what human beings, you can, human beings always mm -hmm. want choices. You know, like, uh, I, the, the story I always tell that uh, uh, when I was, when I first came to America in 1992, I could not buy shampoo in front of a whole full shelf of shampoo because I did right. not know what kind of hair I had. You know, big thing, you got to <laughs> know what kind of hair you have before you can buy shampoo. You got to know it's uh, oily, normal, or dry, those things. So to me, Lady Gaga is just uh, another bottle of shampoo. A different type oh. of shampoo you want. So I've kind of deflected this a little bit, and, and I know that we're really talking about world-class learning, not just the economy. Why don't I bring myself down and bring your slides up, and uh, you can get started with what everybody came here to see. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Mitch, and uh, uh, good afternoon, good evening, or good uh, whatever you, uh, wherever you are. And uh, uh, I think what, what I'm going to do is. Uh, very briefly make a few arguments, but I know many of you are interested in talking about how, not the why, but I think the why is important. And so, uh, uh, Mitch, and this is uh, the slide we have up here, is my website if you're interested in, uh, and my Twitter handle if you want to tweet, or if you have any specific questions or requests, do feel free to email me. And uh, Mitch, can you move to the next slide? And these are the, uh, the books that Corwin has out really regarding these issues. The first one, uh, World Class Learners, lays out the argument and the framework about uh, basically why we need to move toward a different kind of education, a different paradigm of education, as well as uh, a basic uh, in elements of a new uh, education paradigm. Then uh, over the last year, I have been working with a group of practitioners, uh, teachers, school principals, and other leaders in trying to come up with examples and specific strategies and steps that came out to call the take actions uh, on this. So feel free to grab them. And, uh, but in this afternoon, I will just go over some of those ideas and see what can happen. And do feel free to ask questions since the week, uh, we label this at chat. So better be a chat rather than just being information dumping on you. Uh, so let, let's, let me go through this very quickly about why we make this shift. So I want you to look at, uh, what we have come into our schools or come to your home. This is, these are our children. And what do you see that they are extremely diverse, they're extremely happy, they're extremely creative and open-minded. 
and then they are very different. So in terms of difference, I just want to refresh our memory a little bit. You know, we are different in many ways. Physical attributes: some taller, some shorter. Some have darker hair. Some have more hair than others. Uh, and none of this uh, difference technically matter. However, culture or society always attach value to those differences. You know, for example, in America, somehow we got into the idea tall is better, taller people. So you got, uh, you know, height seems to gain value. But then if you think about specific tasks, you know, I think uh, a tall person might work better for a basketball team, but not necessarily work well for gymnastics. You know, just think about your, you know, dancing on those things. And this is the same thing with our other variations in life. For example, you can, uh, as the next slide would show that uh, uh, the Howard Gardner's model of, uh, of uh, multiple intelligences. And uh, this is nothing new. This has been there for a long time. This is a very a layman's of multiple intelligences. That is, we are different. Some people are smart with themselves. Some people are smart with the verbal. Some are having a more potential to learn mathematics, others with music, others in you know, movement. So this is overall the idea that we're born with different learning potentials. And then not only that, as the next slide will show, we have different motivation. This is uh, how are we motivated. Some people care more about grabbing power. Others may be uh, more interested in knowledge, knowing something. The idea is that we are not all motivated by the same thing. I mean, I think uh, you probably know in your class, you know, there are always a few kids who wants to boss other people around, and then there are a bunch of kids who are happy to kind of follow, you know, the same thing. So some people are very much interested in like ordering things, you know, you've seen people who color code everything. Those people who get really angry if you do not put the coffee cup back into the right place and uh, th those things. And others may be interested in, in saving things, collecting things. And this, this is what I call the, I would call this the roots of our passion, you know, where what, what, what are you interested in? When you get to do this kind of things, you're motivated to do, you gain energy, you get more energized. Doesn't mean you cannot do things that you're not you know, born interested in. You could be really very much uh, be asked to do something you don't like, but then you don't like, you try to resist it. And I hope you, you really appreciate this diversity of motivation, because if you don't, you probably get really frustrated with others who don't do similar things. You say, why don't you do this? You know. A lot of uh, domestic tranquility get disturbed because you and your spouse may have different views, your friends. And, uh, you know, for one thing, for example, uh, I, I live in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, I never understood why people kept running around. You know, we are called Track Town USA. And uh, people run around, run for no purpose. They run from one end to another end. There's a circle. Uh, in my village, we always run for a purpose. You run away from something bad, you run towards something good. But here, no, we run around at any time. Now I understand the, the motivator for them is physical activity. You just want to exercise the body. If you put all those things together, we are born with natural tendencies to learn things differently, to appreciate different things, to be motivated, and always with different physical attributes. And that makes our very, very diverse, potentially. Then you add the family, culture, the environment. The nature gets really uh, in enhanced or suppressed by nature, by nurture, by your environment. You know, you may be talented in music, but unless you're given the possibility, given opportunity, you're not developed. It's like an acorn cannot get in, become an oak tree without environment. And environment also adds on, what do we value? What do we get more opportunities for? If you like me, if you're talented in music, you get more music, you become better at music, you get more music, your culture values it, then you become a Lady Gaga, stuff like that. Or if you're born in my village, nobody appreciates it, and we appreciate more your ability to drive the water buffalo, you don't get music, there's no Lady Gaga in my village. That's how it happens. So we have all this diverse of our students, you know, like I showed a slide. And then, but education has traditionally not valued that. You know, traditional education, we want to prepare our children to take a job. And then we got uh, curriculum writers or people who make education policy. We look at the jobs we have, we prescribe, prescribe the set of knowledge, content we need our children to equip, to be equipped with so they can find a job. So we look at jobs like this. You know, we say, okay, they need the basic skills, they need to obey, 
And as you can see on this assembly line, Lady Gaga would be useless. You know, why, why would you need a Lady Gaga? So would uh, Steve Jobs would be useless. Everybody, actually, most people creative will be useless in this one. So based on this our observation of the jobs, we call it employment. We examine what kind of skills and knowledge we have. Then we develop um, content. So can I move this next slide, for example? Uh, so we want to turn all our diversity of our students into this homogeneous set of workers requires similar skills and knowledge. That's school's job to do. And then we develop this model. Next slide, please, Mitch. Now you look at it. This is what our school traditional paradigm, what I call this paradigm, an employee-oriented paradigm. We want to turn all our students into those who can meet the expected outcomes. Then we have, that's why, you know, think about the common core, think about state curriculum, all the prescribed outcome is like want our students to fit into those. So all this human diversity becomes a nuisance, in essence, becomes a problem. We need to suppress that. Then we need to offer all the possibilities to make sure our children to acquire those outcomes. That's called homogenization process. And with that, we have a deficit-driven model our children do not know, we want to fix them. This is how we deal with the massive achievement gap, children coming with different backgrounds, children have you know, other talents. So we want a lot of mediocre people knowing similar things. Creativity is not valued, entrepreneur thinking is not valued because they deviate, they make us deviate from this. And this, by the way, this is the paradigm we've been doing for a long time. This is for employee-oriented paradigm. We are going to produce employees. And this is why my, why most schools are so boring. And uh, we want our children, we basically want to make them suffer enough. We torture them enough. So when they get to the real work on the assembly line, they feel that's better than school anyway. You know, that, that's how we, we prepare them ready. And we, we prepare them ready to comply uh, uh, with, with instructions. And uh, we do this actually through testing as well. We want to make sure our children are moving in, at the same pace, at the same time to right there. Think about your teacher evaluation, student evaluation. Everything is about meeting an instructional goal, instruction based on the prescribed outcome. And we evaluate teachers by how much you know of the prescribed content and how well you instill our students uh, in our students all what you want to do. So all of those measures about instruction, it's, it's all those things. So we, in, in other words, we were education in the old paradigm was to render human beings into human machines so they can have mechanical repetitive jobs that that's what we've been trying to do for a long time and still doing that, that thing right now however as the next slide will show you things have changed you know that's what we call this is our traditional model by the way i was talking about you have one one curriculum this is called a one too many model one teach one textbook one test to all the students, then we can, they can acquire those homogeneous skills and knowledge. And, but this model is, is not working anymore. As we'll see, uh, next slide, things have changed, you know. And the big change, as you can see, is machines, robotics. Some people call, we have entered the age of uh, the second machine age, meaning digital technology. Or we call this the fourth industrial revolution we're arriving, actually starting with the third industrial revolution, that digital technology, computing, artificial intelligence, robotics, have replaced those mechanical jobs, has displaced those workers. And this is why today, everybody, every country is facing the youth unemployment uh, issue. Even though we're still talking about college readiness and career readiness, but my definition of a successful education is what I call out of the basement readiness. A good education can successfully keep your children and other people's children out of their basement. And today, the traditional education is not doing very well. In the US, as many of you noticed, that uh, we got uh, a huge chunk of our college graduates not employed or underemployed. This is why you know, many of college graduates becoming, let's say, baristas, you know, or, or, or what we call that, actually, that's a nice name for coffee maker, uh, uh, makers, or taxi drivers, or all those kind of jobs, uh, or bartenders. We're not doing very well. And uh, at the same time, 
By the way, this is not an American problem. I said that's in China. Uh, youth uh, employment is, uh, is reaching a crisis uh, 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 stage in the U.S., in the U.K., in Canada, every place is, uh, have this issue. And uh, so a lot, you know, we have a new name for this generation. We call them the boomerang generation. That's like Australian game, the boomerang, you throw them out, they come back to your basement and never live again. That's what we have, the generation B. This is not because we did not have more education. It's because we've had the wrong kind of education. The education for employment, employee or in the education does not work anymore because most of those jobs are being replaced by machines and more will come. Not only blue collar workers, but white collar jobs that's going to be shifted. That's a big, big issue right now. Accounting, lawyers, even medicine is facing the same kind of challenges with the machines. So what can we do? In the age of the machines, by the way, I just uh, heard news that uh, you know the uh, Google's AlphaGo just beat one of the best uh, uh, Go players, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually more complicated than chess in Asia and Korea. That's very dangerous. So all the machines replace those jobs. We are not able to simply improve our education to fight the machines to get the jobs back. But my argument in my writings talk about we need a paradigm shift. We need to shift our education from producing employees to entrepreneurs. And in the age of machines, the best way to beat machines is to become more human. So education has to stop turning human beings into not so good machines, but take advantage of the opportunities it has created to help our children become more human. So what makes us more human? I think, Rainy, that's the three things. Number one, human beings are unique, diverse, that we do not have to uh, be repetitive. Human beings are not the same. Machines are very much the same. You know, remember the machine, if you produce one machine, you can make another one. If you create one child, you cannot create that exactly the same one. That's, the, that's our first thing. So my first argument of education is like this slide shows, it's about enhancing individual diversity and help each individual grow better in their own way. I think Todd Rose of Harvard talked about, you know, education, is to create opportunities for every child in their own way. So, so look at each child, what they have, what they bring, and what they're passionate about, and make them better. So that's the first thing. Become machines, become more individual, more human. So education has turned away from imposing on all children the same content, the same knowledge, and fix children's deficit based on external standard toward supporting individual strength and individual passion. So education needs to be completely personalized. It's not about teaching what we think they should learn. It's about supporting what they're passionate about and how to become great. That's the, the, the first thing we need to change in education is from homogenizing into supporting diversifying. It's to enhance human talents. And how do we, then we need to cultivate the second thing that makes human beings, we are creative. We can always come up with unpredicted, unpredictable, unscripted solutions or ideas. We can identify problems to solve. This is machines cannot do. Machines are very task prescript. We have a task for them, you know. You want to play chess, you know, we got a task. But human beings can perhaps randomly come up with different things. And third one, human beings are, what do we call, can create new problems to solve or identify new problems to solve. That's very entrepreneurial. We can deliver value to other people. We can not only solve problems, but we can identify problems that's worth solving. So that's where machines cannot do individual, create, and entrepreneurial. And this, but you know, uh, Mitch came on the next slide. So this is what I would argue the elements of a new education paradigm, a new paradigm. So the first what, which used to be the standardized curriculum, standard for everyone. Now I would like you to become a student-driven curriculum. The curriculum follows each child. And then the how in terms of pedagogy, 
in turn, instead of just in case teaching children some knowledge content, we engage them in making products or works to solve genuine problems, to create value for others. And this way we discipline our creativity and we improve our entrepreneurial thinking and entrepreneurial strategies. And all of this happening in a globalized campus. Because today we need to think about our children can learn from others and globally from others. We don't have to teach children everything. They can actually learn. But more importantly, they want to expose our children to the global market, the global world, so they know that not only are they serving local people, they can serve others. And there are plenty of people our children can create value for. And we can also learn with others so we can develop a, a global partners from anywhere we can. So that's the three basic elements. And here are some suggestions I have as the next slide. You, you can think about uh, as teachers. Then we're going to move to questions. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what I call the, uh, the new element. And this is a bigger slide. The next slide take, deals with each element. So let's move to the next one. Mitch. Yes, please. So you think about a student autonomy. I would ask you to think about what what you, you're doing in, in your classroom or in your school. Do you give students enough voice? That is, it's really about the student. Students can have a voice in constructing classroom rules, how schools or classrooms are organized. Students can have a voice on what courses are offered, on what books they have, what technology they should have how the physical environment they have. I mean, it's a community. They're not coming in there just to be an employee, to do work for you. Some people say that in the, today, in our traditional education, students come to school to watch teachers work. That was the traditional thinking. You know? But now we want us to work with uh, students and help them. So they should have a role, have a voice in constructing the social, physical, and cognitive environment. And then do we give students enough choice. That is, do we give them enough opportunities for them to identify their strength and identify their passion, understand their weaknesses? That needs a very broad curriculum, lots of lots of opportunities because students come in, they don't know what they don't know, so we need to experience that. But once they experience, if they identify something and they do not want to fix their weaknesses, we should give the flexibility of a student constructed learning experience or curriculum. And finally, our teachers, I think we need to shift our role from instructing towards supporting learning. Uh, again, traditional we want, we want to you know our teachers to know as much as possible, to transmit what they know as effectively as possible. So that's why most teacher education programs, teacher evaluation based on how much you know, what you should instruct, and how well you do that. I think that job should be done by machine. You know, that's done. You know, if they want to learn something, they can find that. Many of you may be great. You, you're familiar with blended learning. You're familiar with online learning. Children can do that. Machines can do that. But one thing they cannot do, machines can never replace teachers because of the social emotional support, of the guidance, of the high level judgment you can do and machines cannot do. So that's where I think the teachers will really change our role into mentoring supporting the personalization of students. So this whole element, the three elements actions we can take to support the autonomy. Because students should have a voice in deciding what they want to do, how they want to do it, and we need to follow that. The best curriculum is co-constructed with the, the teacher, the students, the parents, and possibly even the community. We should support that. And in terms of the how, the next slide suggests that and this is what I call product-oriented learning. This is a, a redefinition of uh, project-based learning. Many of you may have heard of project-based learning. Many of you have been practicing project-based learning. And I call this product-oriented learning. It's, called, it's basically a it's very entrepreneur type of project-based learning. Uh, project learning. I call this entrepreneur PDL as well, or I call it POL. The idea is that we have to engage our children in learning to identify problems that's worth solving and producing valuable solutions, authentic solutions that you can actually understand. So this is game value. We create our own job. We find our own space. We create aspiration to serve other people. Unlike our traditional school homework or project-based learning, 
We create projects. Still about standards, still about knowledge. Now, this is really about the product. It actually has to matter to someone. And we, through the process, we learn, we understand what's, what, what is meaningful, what is useful. We learn to identify problems worth solving, but also we learn to discipline our creativity and entrepreneur thinking, to learn about the growth mindset, to learn about resilience, because everybody can have a few ideas. But unless through efforts, through multiple mistakes and failure, you cannot do that. Also use this, you know, remember entrepreneur thinking and creativity has to be very much strength based. So when you ask your students, say, well, everybody can write a book. You know, I think this morning through Ed Corps, which I'll introduce briefly uh, uh, with a group of ninth graders this morning I was talking with, they want to write a book about sex education for others. So question I asked them is why you? So what, what, what makes it unique to write this book, to think about this? And so how, what kind of solution you can provide? And so you, everybody needs to identify their uniqueness, their unique greatness. Use your strength, not use your weakness to, to, to drive this idea. So that's where I think the, the three elements I would use in product-oriented learning. Ask yourself, are you engaged students in making things that's meaningful, that's authentic, serves a genuine purpose? And do they go through a, a process of review and run re revision so they can have their process disciplined, very well disciplined? And also, are they developing the understanding of the strength and weaknesses? This is the base, by the way, of true collaboration with others. That you know your strength, you know your weaknesses, so you can collaborate with others. In our classroom, a lot of projects you know, are not truly collaborated because you're asking students to do the same thing. In a really genuine product or in learning, you would ask the students to do things they're good at and they want to be better, they can better at, they can improve. And finally, in terms of the global campus, you know, we have to, the next slide, please, uh, Mitch, and is the understanding of how to work with others. You know, when we talk about, I was joking about Lady Gaga, if Lady Gaga had lived in a small village without a global connection, she probably cannot get out of her parents' basement, you know. But now with this idea of global market, with technology, satellite, television, video, Netflix, all those things, and fly, airplane, uh, you know, jet planes, she can fly to different places. Even though she may only appeal to a very small percentage of the population, small percent population, the base has become so large, so she can be valuable. Because many of her unique talents do not appeal to the masses, to, you know. 90% of the people. Now, with tech, with a globalization, we can reach a lot more people, but our students, our future entrepreneurs need to understand that they need, to, they need to have the ability, the talent, and the experience to engage on a global scale. So this is what uh, the three elements uh, we have. And I was going to, I, th I think, uh, give some people are asking for examples. So how do we actually do this? There are many things that, uh, 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 many examples I can give, a lot of things that can ha happen, but I want to give you a, a, an example of, uh, I think, John may be on this, who created this then. And Mitch, how do I send you a, a web link to everybody? Okay, so it's so it's a little bit difficult, um, but if you um, I, I basically, yeah, if you if you spell it, because I, normally I, I would if if it were if we're on a slide already, I, I could I could show it on, on a slide, or you could share it with the people in your room by typing in the im in in your room, okay. but then the other people would wouldn't see it. So probably the best way is is for you to spell it out. Okay. Well, it's okay. Uh, ed. C-O-R-P-S dot O-R-G. It's called Ed Corpse, E-D-C-O-R-P-S dot O-R-G. And it's created by, by John. I think John may be in the room. And uh, if you can find it, you can, can reach him to, to talk about this. And uh, so this is a website, a good example showing entrepreneurial student work. And when you got, get on there, that we have, uh, uh, John just emailed me with great results. Students were creating beauty products, were designing coasters, but they all serve a genuine purpose. 
that is that students are actually making authentic products go out. Mm -hmm. I also speak of, um, you know, personalization. I was in a school uh, in Australia recently, and they basically have students. Uh, they really ask students what would like to take, what what would they can learn. Kids want to learn about video games. They offer that. They want to learn about handling animals. They offer that. So you want to follow students. And by the way, I just want to add one more element. The idea of personalized learning, that supporting students, follow students, also enhances, enhances students' engagement. As you know, our one-size-fits-all uh, discriminate against students' talent. Mm -hmm. You know, those who happen to be good with reading and numeracy and math get highlighted and go to special, uh, go to, uh, you know, uh, talented and gifted. But those who are great in other domains are not valued as much. So it's really a discrimination. So we, that's why we lose a lot of students as, uh, as the grades go on. If we can follow children's passion, give every student a chance to be great at in school, not only will help them become future job creators, but also, you know, actually we engage them a lot more. So I think, Amit, I will stop there and take some questions. I've already kind of talked about for some 30 minutes. So, so what I'd like to do is, is if uh, somebody would like, if you have video, if you would like to come up on stage and ask a question, uh, click on that raise hand button and then I can bring you on stage. In the meantime, I, I picked up some of the questions that people had asked originally. Um, you know, when they when they registered, one of the questions was specifically on the early grades. So, are there things that you can do in, say, K one um, that inspire world class learning, or K? Let's say, let's pick K two for example. Uh, Dr. Zhao, can can you give us some examples from elementary? Uh, hold on, I'm trying to get. Uh, I was trying to get Zhang on there. Uh, can you bring uh, Zhang on? I think uh, uh, because well, he can I give could, like, real but, examples. He's been supporting of Okay, then what okay, you have to example, do, Zhang, is you if have you to, to. And if Zhang clicks on the raise hand button, ah, there I can see you. That's Molly. So I'm going to bring Molly up first. Um, okay, let me let me. Okay, um, so I'll, 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 it. I've seen it. I think it's better to have. Okay, it. one second. I'm going to bring. Come on. This is fancy technology. I'm not familiar with. Hey, Young, how are? Great, John. Go ahead. Uh, share that story about the uh, Elm School in uh, um, Rome, Georgia, please. Sure. So Elm Street Elementary is a Title One school. 10% uh, homeless. 93% free reduced lunch and this summer we contacted their teacher and offered them funding to start a student run business we call Ed Corps. Oh, I'm getting a note here. Uh, oh, how it works in K1. So basically the students, um, it's a rural town, they uh, decided to grow their own herbs and make a product um, called a sugar scrub which is an exfoliating scrub and through the process of project based learning this teacher has taught every subject through the lens of business. Uh, they've done roughly $17,000 in sales since August, and she recently won the Paul Allen Distinguished Educator Award. Uh, but what it means for the students basically is they get to learn um, through an authentic environment where they're creating products that have value, uh, and they're using this framework to get out of the classroom to learn how to communicate with adults, uh, learn math, uh, learn geography through where they ship their products to, which at this point is all 50 states and internationally in five countries. But the idea that Ashley's piloted uh, for first grade is kind of a reinvention of how project-based learning works through the entrepreneurial lens. Thank you, John. John is the founder and the philanthropist behind uh, Ed Corps. And uh, just give another idea for K1. Uh, I know a lot of you practice writing and drawing and painting and doing technology stuff. Because I've uh, I've been uh, I was in uh, elementary school in Australia and they actually wrote books, but the, most of the books were printed and wrote for themselves. The students. I was encouraging them to think about how about you turn them into interactive iBooks and publish them online, but write for students in other countries who are learning English, and then you have a real audience and people would love to do that. And that's something 
you know, uh, you, you can do it K, uh, K1. You can, of course, do it higher grades as well, you know, so that's some, something it's always possible to do. Uh, thanks, John. You have anything else to share about EdCorps with uh, our, our um, people who might find it very interesting? You can, uh, you can read up more at realworldscholars.org. Uh, <laughs> if you're a teacher interested in funding and doing this, that's what we do and be happy to support you. Um, but basically, it's if you've read the book World Class Learners, it's the application process of product-oriented learning. Thanks, John. Good to see you. Other questions? So, so, so there was another question at at the beginning. Um, the, as a um, well, the, the one question was: if you're a high, let's say you're a high school teacher, and you're teaching one subject, um, and let's arguably say English, and you know that your students at the end of the year are going to be taking this test on English, and you're just kind of struggling to get through all the material to take the test. How do you? still allow for the individualization and the student voice and um, it, it, inspiring creativity that really is going to prepare them uh, to move out of, the, out of their parents' basement, um, but also understand that what you're, you're being measured on their ability to, to pass the test. I feel for you. It's extremely tough. I, I understand the constraints. I wish I could remove all those constraints. And, uh, you know, however, even with that constraint, I still think it's possible uh, to do this. And uh, that is, you can at least, you know, uh, maybe have students nominate, ask, or I say they would uh, maybe uh, can nominate like 30% uh, of the content they would like to do in this class. You can always have a constraint list. It's not ideal at all. I, trust me, I don't believe it's ideal. You, you can't achieve nearly as much as if you had that. No constraints like that, but you, you could ask them in you know, like third percent of topics uh, uh, can be covered, nominated by students. Students can, uh, of course, they can debate, you know, they can do research, they can argue why my topic deserves to be to be done. And you can always try to work on uh, writing uh, a book together uh, in English. If you, you, if you do, I don't know about uh, grade, what they do, you write book reviews. Maybe you can do more authentic book reviews. Uh, if not published for somebody, maybe review books on Amazon, for example. That actually matters or maybe you can it's just every year you can start a youtube channel of the video uh, review of books but hold them accountable and somebody use that uh, review uh, possibility you've seen children making loads of money reviewing toys and children's books online and on a video you can probably start something or you can, if you're interested in doing grammar again you can set up a online grammar workshop for students uh, immigrant children uh, coming here or uh, into other domains i think uh, there's a lot of things you could do, and but ne again, I, I feel for you, it's not nearly po uh, as much possible. Uh, when I teach, I, can, I try to get my students to co-author with me. Uh, I just did one book called uh, Counting What Counts, was co-authoring with a number of my students. Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach another class at the University of Oregon. We got a bunch of the doctoral students. We may be writing a book together about uh, education reforms at a system level for different countries. So I always encourage people to, you know, to do things. So again, Three things, you can, if you can keep in mind, have your students uh, being able to customize part portions of the curriculum. I don't think you'll miss much. And have them work towards an uh, outcome that's authentic. And also think about a global uh, audience and or global partnership. And uh, uh, the, uh, another thing I just want to add in that class, especially if you're losing a lot of students you're not interested in, and again, they will drag down your score anyway. Maybe you want to re-engage them back through some other means. So uh, I would rather take care of all stress tests. Trust me, I, I don't think they mean anything. Yes, and I'm sorry for you. And uh, they get rid of the curriculum. Uh, but maybe you can use this video somehow to convince your school not hold you accountable. OK, so we do have a, uh, somebody who raised his hand, uh, Mike McGraw, who would like to ask you a question. So I'm going to come down and bring him up. Okay. Hi, Dr. Zhao. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. My name, yeah, good to see you. My name is Michael Crawford. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Kansas in Educational Psychology and also the Chief Academic Officer at the Entrepreneurial Learning Initiative. 
my dog is is trying to steal the, the spotlight. Um, my question, <laughs> my question is, um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about constraints, uh, and I wondered if you could sort of reflect on what you see are some of the biggest challenges to the type of product-oriented learning or entrepreneurial learning uh, that you write about and that you talk about. I, I know I've read your world-class learners and a number of other books from you and a lot of your uh, your blog posts as well. And, and everything I read it sounds great. It seems like it makes perfect sense. It seems like it's absolutely in line with what we need for the future of uh, the education and economy and and our nation, frankly. Uh, and so I wonder, you know, what types of things do you see uh, as being some of the biggest hurdles to overcome in order to get uh, what you recommend uh, actually in practice. Thanks, Mike, and uh, really good to see you. Take care of that dog. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I think the biggest one is actually our own mindset. Uh, it is real that the uh, national standardization, the traditional thinking of paradigm, you know, we, we kept moving this one direction. It's always hard to change in the middle. So we have curriculum, we have standards, we have accountability, we have all of those things. Those things do exist. And but I think they will be gone, actually. If we but they won't be gone by themselves. We have to work toward it to make them disappear, a paradigm shift. But at the same time, I've seen amazing schools doing amazing things within those constraints. Uh, and uh, an individual teacher like Elm Street, uh, for example, uh, John talking about can do something. Schools can do something. I'm now uh, working with uh, three networks of schools in Australia, uh, one in Victoria, one in uh, New South Wales, one in uh, South Australia. They're all, uh, gov and then most of them are government schools, some are independent schools, but they are all were subject to traditional government regulations, accountability. Uh, what I see, I tell them, I said, uh, let's start by asking what we can do following this framework within the constraints. And then let's try to understand what kind of obstacles need to be gone. So we're doing the kind of DNR, what I call not R&D, development and research. Understand what systemic things are there, what of those obstacles are imagined, what of them are you know, real. So we want to understand this piece. And uh, the, I would say we have enough space. The biggest one is when our mindset is people think that we cannot do something. And I really think we can. Another obstacle is we have is that we believe um, we got to have our teachers to be ready for this. And I think teachers are absolutely important, but I don't think we should mess up with teachers' lives. All of you standing here, you got plenty of things to do. What you need to do is to back off a little bit. You know, you don't have to be trained in all of those things. because so many reasons. I will let students drive the innovation process, especially some, when I'm working with the schools. I said, well, do something this to for those kids who are disengaged anyway. Can we create something for them without necessarily changing teachers' behaviors? Because a lot of them are entrepreneur students. They are just in, disengaged. They're causing trouble. So I would like to say teachers can say, okay, we retreat, but also capitalize on a few very entrepreneur thinking teachers. Teachers are human beings. They are not trivialized mechanical delivery machines. You know, I think in our current system. We treat teachers as a UPS delivery guy. You have a package from the curriculum office, you message to students, then someone comes to a server, did you deliver that to a customer? Teachers are much more than that. Teachers are much more human. But so when teachers, when they look at the teachers, a few teachers won't get out of the mode, who are brave enough, we need to support them as well. So, but we, but we cannot wait for every teacher to be convinced. You know, when I go around, people always, oh, teacher's not ready. Then the teachers blame, or parents are ready. Parents blame schools are horrible. And then some people blame university not ready. I said, we cannot, we, there's plenty of blame to go around. We can blame the government, we can blame Trump, we can blame uh, uh, Obama. But ultimately, we got to start somewhere. I think it's possible to start. So I understand the obstacles, but I appreciate more of the actual space we have if we are brave enough to do it. Great, thank you very much. Okay, now, there's been a bunch of questions around assessing uh, the, you know, the holistic student. And, uh, you know, so one question relating to it is, are there tests that test the, you know, the 
um, you know, the, the whole part of the student, not just their academic knowledge, but um, their ability to problem solve, their ability to be entrepreneurial, their, their creativity. Are there, are there ways of assessing that? Or how would we you assess know, that? It's a, it's a challenging process. Uh, if you're interested in, take a look at uh, the book I just mentioned called Counting What Counts, Reframing Educational Outcomes, published mm -hmm. by Solution Tree. And uh, you have actually I published the, the preface, uh, the introduction piece on my website, as well as the Washington Post blog, and you can take a look at that. The, we, in the book, we catalog uh, a list of those attributes you mentioned about. And uh, I, I have to tell you, it's not easy to measure something like that. It's, we don't know how to measure, because a lot of times creativity, resilience, entrepreneurial thinking, and not necessarily in the traditional sense, a linear progression. And it's not generic either. Actually, they are also very task and specific. And it's also individual specific. So the, the biggest challenge, even though you can apply them to do that, but I would encourage us to look at the actual products our children have created. And look at that product through the multiple drafts, how far they have gone through the process, rather than just trying to use one simple Simplistic measure of captures. You can definitely measure some of those, but uh, psychologists and psychologists are, are working very hard to do that. And uh, but you, if you want to get a generic picture like the PISA, like and uh, like NAEP, it's very it's very difficult. And most of the traditional assessment, they don't they, they don't measure surprises. You know, rubric or whatever they measure prescribed content. I call them measure med medi mediocrity. You know, you might just call it, uh, let's say, physics. You know, whatever physics test you have, Einstein would score as high as the, the, the highest scoring kit on your test. Remember that? So, so do you think Albert Einstein's mm -hmm. just as good right. as others? So you don't measure surprises. That, that's, but in our thinking about creativity, entrepreneurial, and individualized learning, it's all about exceptionality, individuality, you know, surprises. Again, I would suggest another book, which I did not write, I hope, I wish I did write, wrote the one, it's called The End of Average. That's by Todd Rose, The End mm -hmm. of Average. So, um, so you know, I, I don't I have guess, good assessment, but if you want, there are assessments out there, but they are not very good. Right, that's, that's, that was my impression also, is that, is, and, it's, and it's a shame too, because on the one hand, you have a really simplistic number that's out there, so you could say, hey, on, the sta on my common core test, or you know, whatever, whatever the school uses, a person got a 95, or, or they're, they're, they're number four, and, but we can't say that as a human being, this person is well on the way to becoming you know, an, a, a great human being. It's, it, um, it, it, there's no simple... It, sound, it doesn't sound like there's a simple answer, right? I don't think you never stop becoming great anyway, you know, even, so it's, it's very hard to be great all the time, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, if Go you ahead. were, you, you know, a, a few questions also came in about leadership. So if you wanted to, if, if you were a principal or a superintendent or a board member in a, in a district, and you wanted to create an environment where uh, you know the whole child was educated, and we and we're preparing people for this times of abundance, um, where everybody, uh, where we support the um, the strengths of the child rather than just fill their deficits. How would you get that started in a school or district? Well, that's why I think uh, we try to do that, you know, by writing those books. Those three books, follow-up books that could take action books, has some suggestions, some example strategies. I would uh, suggest you get hold of those and do maybe a study group. And uh, we also try to run um, uh, like two-day workshops from Corwin, and I'm working with the schools over year-long process and. Uh, Basically, to, to, first of all, you got inspired. You got to lay out the vision and uh, also talk about really the necessity that the traditional model is really not working. I think we'll see more miserable stuff coming out in the next five, 10 mm -hmm. years. It's, uh, and the big debate, actually, honestly, in the presidential election is about the widening uh, a gap between uh, top right. and uh, lower income people, mm -hmm. the disappearing, shrinking middle class. has a lot to do with education, too. Those mm -hmm. who could actually learn to take advantage of technology 
uh, and moved out of middle class, become upper class, those who didn't were handed no jobs. I mean, that, that's why, you know, or lower kind of jobs. That's why the middle class shrinking. We have the growing bottom. This is, it's a very serious issue that uh, we got to be aware of. And uh, as you know, all universities, the good ones at least, are shifting how they admit students. Companies are changing their hiring practices, moving away from simple traditional measures of being a good student. Being a good student is no longer adequate. Now, being a good student is like being a good employee. That's not adequate. So I would think we'll start with vision. But also, really, uh, two examples. Examples always inspire students, parents, teachers, do things. So we, in our books, we write about that. And I collect books, uh, a lot of examples from different places. People email me. You know, like just now, the Ed Corpse, when John created that, get on that. You can see a lot of amazing things that teachers can do. do. Hmm. And But also, as a school leader, I wouldn't suggest changing everything. You know, I, I always endorse the model, the Google 80-20 rule, change 20%, or build something called X model. You always want to cult, cultivate the next practices, you know, next practice, what could it be? You know, again, you invite those who are willing and able to change, not impose this on everybody. So that's my philosophy. Do not impose, say, every teacher has to do this, every student has to do this, all curriculum has to be out of the window. You don't have to do that. You do this, you start a gradual, a revolutionary evolutionary step, that's how I would say, you know, a group of students, group of teachers, group of parents, you gradually move toward, you know, it's like tipping point. You want this to organically grow into a revolution. Well, kind of like the uh, corporation books in the 1980s talked about, or 1990s talked about skunk works. And so you build a group of people who are passionate about something, they start implementing, and then you use them as um, both as an example and as your proselytizers, right? Isn't that yeah, to certain extent what you're saying? You wanna, yes, you want to make sure you take action because I think we talk too much. I think right now that's why you know we a lot of schools talk too much and they question too much. I think they are just they read this and read that, just delaying their misery. They they play with a strategic planning, vision statement. I said, forget about that. Take some action. At least create opportunities for the few teachers, few students who want to do something, support innovation, cultivate innovation, not trying to fight resistance. I think this is some, and there are things that can be done, and actually I want to emphasize, we can be done now, and uh, we should start, no matter how small it is, we should start mm. doing something now. And when people, people, I mean, your community, your parents, your uh, government, whatever, when they see the few successes, they will move. You know, they, they need the inspiration. You will become the pioneers to move the needle. So as you're saying, it's kind of like get in the game. Don't talk about the game. Don't watch the game. You're not playing the game unless you're in the game. Exactly. So, well, you know, the, the only thing that changes action is take action. <laughs> right. So I think we have time for one more person to come up. And I see uh, person uh, Bob Isaacson. Uh, his hand is raised. So I'm going to bring myself down and bring Bob up, if, if that's okay with you. Sure. Please, Bob. Ni howdy. It's very, yeah, I'm very, good, very good, excited. Uh, and it's good to see you again, Bob. How are you? Yeah. It's very good to see you again. Uh, we are very excited here at the University of Kansas that you're going to be joining us. So, uh, One of the things that we have that is a tremendous resource for entrepreneurs is the Kauffman Foundation here in Kansas City. In addition, at the Edwards campus where I teach, we have a Confucius Institute, which is uh, a very nice global outreach. Uh, so we're really looking forward to you uh, coming here, but uh, I really want to uh, see if we can get connected to the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, they have done a lot of work with entrepreneurship in schools, and they promote uh, across the country a thing called a million cups that's held every Wednesday where they have entrepreneurs that come in, pitch ideas to angel investors for starting new businesses, and they're by people who are entrepreneurs and local businesses, and uh, it's a really, really uh, uh, wonderful culture of entrepreneurship here in the Kansas City area. So it will be a wonderful opportunity to work Bob, for you, I, I, with you. Bob, thank you. I, I'm looking forward to this because one thing I do want 
to is uh, come to Kansas to work with you and the Kaufman, whoever wants to be in, maybe I'm Michael, to uh, maybe build a network, of Kansas network of entrepreneur schools so we can get this going, put it on the ground and get to change students. We have the spirit, but we need a spirit to get down to much, much earlier level than what we have just after graduation. It would be really interesting to develop an entire K-12 curriculum. And then I'm finding with my own uh, students in, in the graduate program in Ed Tech that I always am telling them they need more entrepreneurially because the jobs are increasingly few and far between. So it's a different mindset. Well, thank you. Uh, let me just end by, Bob, uh, as an example. I'm, I'm helping two Chinese students who have been to University of Oregon for four years studying business management. They can't find employment anywhere in China or the U.S. I said, why don't you think about how good you are understanding two cultures, two universities. They begin to think about their strength. They say, well, we may be able to build a business to support Chinese students who want to study here, support universities take Chinese students. I said, yes, that's what we're doing. So I'm helping them to write a book, set up a website to start a consulting firm. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I have. It's it's funny that you're talking about that because I have a. Um, well, she's a she's an adult now, but she was she was in high school when she lived with us for a year. Who's um, going through the same thing? I mean, she's a PhD student in psychometrics, and the question is, where where is she going to find a job? And um, as you say, she, she's she's going to have to create her own job. Um, because, it, but, but she has so many skills because she's bicultural, exactly. uh, and she's bi multilingual. Um, she's great in, in, in math. She's great in, you know, there's so many things she's great in. She just has to now figure out, uh, something that's going to be valuable to other people. So this, there's, there's a lot of people have texted me and just said, uh, thank you so much. Pardon? What, sorry, you were saying? I, I, I missed what you what you just said. Um, it's just Bob said it's mindset change, change of mm -hmm. change of mindset. That's it, yeah. Right, right. Um, so, do you have uh, some uh, closing remarks that you want to say? Um, do you want me to bring your slides back up? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think that's necessary. You can share. I just want to thank everybody for trying to engage conversation. It's not a good time necessarily. I think some of them are having dinner, but I appreciate the enthusiasm, interest of all of you in thinking about the future of our children. And this is a, a brief new journey we got to take. And uh, some of us, you know, you know, we don't know all the answers, but I think it's better to build uh, build a new. Wait, 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 wait. No, the the reason the reason we invited you on EdGen Interactive is I was told you have all the answers. You mean you don't? You came on under false pre pretenses? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> thank you, Mitch. Thank okay. you for, for moderating. You are great. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming. Um, you're, you know, I've, as I said, I've, I've watched your videos. This is the first time I've actually had a chance to interact with you like this. This was great. And, um, you know, I hope to, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be reading your books, more of your books, and watching your videos, and hope to see you at a conference or online. So th thank you again. And this is Mitch Weisberg I'll, signing off for EdChat Interactive. This has been fascinating. For those of you who are still on, you should know that this is being recorded. And we're going to email you um, the link to the recording. And we'll also email you the, um, the, the slides uh, that, that we use during the session. And uh, if you'd like an acknowledgement from us that you attended, uh, because you, you need some type of an acknowledgement for, uh, for credit, uh, just you, you got the email from us to, uh, to join here, just re reply to that and let us know that you need an acknowledgement and we'll send you one. Uh, so hope to see you at our next event. Uh, we have one coming up on Thursday. Um, and signing off, this is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive. See you soon. <laughs>